Welcome to Emmanuel Church Glenhaven Bible Talks. Our church loves to engage with God's written word, the Bible, as we gather week by week. If you missed a sermon or want to hear it again, we pray that your time here today will refresh and renew you as you follow Jesus. Today we continue our series of sermons on the first few chapters of Genesis called Good. If you toss a pebble into a peaceful pond, you can watch gentle ripples caress the surface of the water. But if you heave in a great boulder, it stirs up mud from the bottom. Wild waves make the water rough and choppy. That one action soils and spoils the peace and serenity. In this talk, Michael Robinson takes us to Genesis chapter 4. There we see the ripple effect of Adam and Eve's sin, upsetting not only their environment, but close human relationships. As we read the tragedy of Cain and Abel, Michael explains that we have the same heart problem that Cain had. Then he shows us how we can avoid following the way of Cain. But before we hear from Michael, let's listen to the Bible. The passage is Genesis chapter 4, verses 1 to 16. Adam made love to his wife Eve, and she became pregnant and gave birth to Cain. She said, With the help of the Lord I have brought forth a man. Later she gave birth to his brother Abel. Now Abel kept flocks, and Cain worked the soil. In the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. And Abel also brought an offering, fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. The Lord looked with favour on Abel and his offering, but on Cain and his offering he did not look with favour. And so Cain was very angry, and his face was downcast. Then the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you but you must rule over it. Now Cain said to his brother Abel, Let's go out to the field. While they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, Where is your brother Abel? I don't know, he replied. Am I my brother's keeper? The Lord said, What have you done? Listen, Your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. Now you are under a curse and driven from the ground, which opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you work the ground, it will no longer yield its crops for you. You will be a restless wanderer on the earth. Cain said to the Lord, My punishment is more than I can bear. Today you are driving me from the land, and I'll be hidden from your presence, I'll be a restless wanderer on the earth, and whoever finds me will kill me. But the Lord said, Do not so. Anyone who kills Cain will suffer vengeance seven times over. Then the Lord put a mark on Cain, so that no one who found him would kill him. So Cain went out from the Lord's presence, and lived in the land of Nod, east of Eden. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And now, here's Michael. What makes you angry? Perhaps you're angry about the events of the 24th of February 2022, when Russia invaded Ukraine, the largest attack on a European country since World War II. Or perhaps you're angry about the events of the 7th of October, 2023, when Hamas invaded Israel and massacred 1,200 civilians and kidnapped 240 others. The largest slaughter of Jews in a single day since the Holocaust in World War II. Or perhaps you're angry about the ongoing conflict in that part of the world. Whatever your views are on Israel's response, 
in which more and more civilians suffer and die. Or perhaps you're angry about the policies and behaviour of our leaders in our own country on all sides of politics. But I venture to guess that most people are angry about things that happened to themselves. So many personal disappointments, like being passed over for a promotion, dumped by a lover, bullied by a neighbour or a workmate, just drawing the short straw in life's unpredictable twists and turns. And you feel angry. It's not right, and it's not fair. You might not talk about it, or, or you might, but your anger leads to resentment, and the resentment is always bubbling away just below the surface. I don't know if that description fits you, but it certainly fits me. Someone once said, resentment is like drinking poison and waiting for the other person to die. <laughs> but resentment doesn't always wait for the other person to die, as we'll see today. For jealousy is the raw material of murder. Now, I don't know what's bubbling below the surface of your life right now, what disappointments and hurts are still festering in your heart. But I'm glad you're here, because anger is just one letter short of danger, and God has something to say to you about it. And so we turn to Genesis chapter 4. So far in Genesis, we've seen God creating a very good heavens and earth, making people in his own image to govern and care for his creation. And last week we saw how humanity rebelled against God and found themselves outside the Garden of Eden, facing a difficult and painful mortal existence. But chapter 4 opens with a hopeful note. Adam made love to his wife Eve and she became pregnant and gave birth to Cain. She said, with the help of the Lord, I have brought forth a man. Later, she gave birth to his brother, Abel. Now, Abel kept flocks and Cain worked the soil. Adam and Eve were fulfilling their God-given commission to be fruitful and increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it. Indeed, making babies, whatever else it was, was an act of faith, trusting that God's promise to give them offspring who would eventually crush the serpent's head. As well, the occupations of the two brothers fitted with God's command to work the earth and care for it. Now, only Cain and Abel are named right now because they are the focus of this particular account. But we know from Genesis chapter 5, verse 4, that Adam and Eve had other sons and daughters. Despite the disaster of sin and the expulsion from Eden, humanity was getting on with it. Indeed, God is still very much a part of their lives outside the Garden of Eden. We read in chapter 4, verse 3, In the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord, and Abel also brought an offering, fat portions, from some of the firstborn of his flocks. Nowhere do we read that God required them to make offerings like this. Rules about offerings and sacrifices would come many, many years later. But for now, it was an obvious and instinctive thing to do, to thank God for his bounty, his bounty to them as they worked at shepherding and farming. And appropriately, the gifts that they offered came from their own produce. But now, a dark cloud dulls the brightness of this idyllic scene. We read in chapter 4, verse 4, the Lord looked with favour on Abel and his offering, but on Cain and his offering, the Lord did not look with favour. Why was God pleased with Abel and his offering, but not pleased with Cain and his offering? The text doesn't say. It certainly isn't because Abel offered meat and Cain offered fruit and veg. Although the text does say that Abel brought fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock, the best bits, I'm not sure we can therefore conclude that Cain was slapdash about it and just brought some rubbish. 
He didn't bring first fruits. Uh, it doesn't say that he had to bring first fruits. He just brought an offering. No, there's, there's something happening here that we can't see just by looking at it. Not yet, anyway. On the surface, everything can appear to be fine, even impressive. But remember what God said to Samuel when Samuel went to Bethlehem to anoint the second king of Israel. Samuel was very impressed with the first of Jesse's sons. But God said to him, Do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord doesn't look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance. But the Lord looks at the heart. Now, I can't tell what's in your heart right now any more than you can tell what I'm dealing with right now. And just because a person dresses up for church and puts on a nice smile doesn't mean that everything is right between them and God. Now, God isn't necessarily pleased with you because you're here today or chatting warmly with others or leading the music or preaching a sermon. God sees the heart and it's the state of the heart that matters, not mere activity. As God would say centuries later through the prophet Isaiah, these people come near to me with their mouth and honour me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Cain's reaction to God's displeasure reveals the state of his heart. So Cain was very angry and his face was downcast. To say that Cain was disappointed with God is an understatement. He is furious and he scowls bitterly. He's angry with God because despite all his efforts and his generous gift, God didn't care for it. Worse, God favoured his little brother. No wonder he's angry with God. But should he be angry? Benjamin Franklin said, Anger is seldom without a reason, but seldom a good reason. Cain's fierce reaction reveals a deep darkness within him, and it's this that tainted his gift. Cain's offering wasn't the problem. It was the state of his heart. We can so easily follow the way of Cain and become sullen and resentful when God doesn't come through for us. God doesn't always behave the way we want him to or do what we expect him to do. God doesn't always say yes to our prayers, even when we think our prayers are so humble and so reasonable. God doesn't always make our lives easy. At times, in fact, he seems to pile disaster upon disaster upon disaster. And you really feel it when the undeserving get the acclaim and the lucky breaks. They don't have troubles. Their bodies are healthy and strong. They don't have the problems that others have. They don't suffer as other people do. And it seems like trying to do what is good and right is a waste of time. And sometimes it even makes things worse. The way of Cain is anger at God for not pleasing us when we think he's holding out on us. But anger at God is a symptom of underlying unbelief. And Cain's lack of faith, his lack of trust in God and what God was saying, is what displeased God. On the other hand, as Francis Schaeffer points out, it was by faith that Abel offered a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain, which means he had faith in God and was right with God. We are in a dangerous condition when we fail to trust God. When we fail to accept that his ways are always good, even when life disappoints us, or when we suffer pain and distress and uncertainty. So here's the state of Cain's heart. It was an unbelieving heart. 
One writer says the law of life outside the garden is the same as the law inside, trusting obedience in God. But Cain is not willing for that. And he gets angry. So whatever prompted his gift, it was apparently not love and gratitude to God. It was a performance, nothing more. But God graciously moves towards Cain to teach him about the state of his heart and the danger of lurking sin. The Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must rule over it. The problem is that sin now lurks within the heart of every descendant of Adam and Eve. It's the indwelling menace that produces all kinds of evil behaviour. As Jesus told his disciples, what comes out of a person is what defiles them. For it's from within, out of a person's heart, that evil thoughts come. Sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance and folly. But the fact of indwelling sin in no way excuses our sinful behaviour. We are responsible and accountable to God for what we do. We sin deliberately and willfully. As commentator John Walton puts it, to put the problem another way, distance from God is not just because we sin, it's because we enjoy sin cherish sinful ways, even protect our right to sin and resist any attempt to harness our depravity. If you didn't enjoy sin, you wouldn't do it, would you? Or as the Apostle James puts it, each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. And then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. And in Cain and Abel's case, it led to literal death. As old Matthew Henry put it, when anger was in Cain's heart, murder was not far off. So in verse 8, and Cain said to his brother Abel, let's go out to the field. And while they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. Simply told, no embellishment or gory details needed. It is simply horrifying. Cain has refused to heed the Lord's warning to rule over his sinful passion. He opens the door of his heart to the angry monster lurking outside and in it leaps and devours its prey. But once again, God graciously moves towards Cain. But Cain keeps his distance with lies and disclaimers. The Lord said to Cain, where is your brother Abel? I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? No repentance, not even remorse. Cain's anger and resentment remain unchanged. Francis Schaeffer again says, it's just like the Lord to give us another opportunity to obey him. And it's just like stubborn sinners to refuse his gracious help. And so God pronounces his sentence. The farmer will find the ground doesn't work for him anymore. He's doomed to wander off and eke out a living some other way. And his only response is to complain. 
My punishment is more than I can bear. Today you're driving me from the land. I'll be hidden from your presence. I'll be a restless wanderer on the earth, and whoever finds me will kill me. Cain's greatest fear is that someone might murder the murderer, but God graciously alleviates his fear. The Lord said to him, Not so. Anyone who kills Cain will suffer vengeance seven times over. And so off goes Cain. God doesn't expel him. Cain just leaves. He takes himself off into exile, away from the garden, finally turning his back on God. What a tragic account. And it'll only get worse, as we'll see next week. From Genesis chapter 6, the Lord saw how great the wickedness of the human race had become on the earth and that every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart was only evil all the time. But don't read the account of Cain and merely feel very sad and sorry about the whole catastrophic drama because you are an actor in the same play. We sons and daughters of Adam and Eve carry sin embedded in our hearts. Sin is constantly lurking at the door, ready to pounce. Sin has affected every part of our being, our thoughts, our desires, our intentions, even our acts of kindness are tainted by sin. Maybe it's pride or maybe it's a desire that someone will think well of us. We might not express our rebellion as violently as Cain did or as others do, but it's there. Don't forget Jesus' warning in the Sermon on the Mount. You've heard that it was said to people long ago, you shall not murder and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. So how do you rule over lurking sin? Two things. Firstly, run to the Lord who graciously moved towards Cain again and again. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in love. Put your faith in him. Trust him. Trust his very great and precious promises, knowing that Whatever he gives you in this life, pleasant or not, is for your good and for his glory. Let your trust in God's sovereign goodness and mercy starve the monster lurking at the door. There's an old hymn that expresses his confidence in God, whatever happens. Here's the last verse. Whate'er my God ordains is right. Here shall my stand be taken. Though sorrow, need, or death be mine, yet I am not forsaken. My Father's care is round me there. He holds me that I shall not fall, and so to him I leave it all. Trust in God's sovereign goodness. Secondly, Seek his mercy every time you fall back into sin. Don't deflect like Cain did. Confess your anger or whatever sin it is that betrays your lack of faith in God's goodness. For there is mercy with him. As the psalmist said, If you, Lord, kept a record of sins, Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness so that we can, with reverence, serve you. Cain was accused and condemned by the spilt blood of his brother. But there is spilt blood that cries for mercy. The writer of the Hebrews says, Come to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. Through the death of the Lord Jesus Christ, God forgives all who turn away from their sin, turn back to him and put their trust in him. And by the gift of his Holy Spirit, we are able to please God, as did the faithful and righteous Abel. 
as Paul told the Christians in Galatia, those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are good and gracious to sinners like us. Thank you that you constantly move towards us. Yes, to rebuke us, but also to draw us into your forgiveness and peace. Help us to trust you. Help us to flee to you for mercy when we fail. And thank you that by your Holy Spirit, you are graciously pleased with our faltering efforts to do good. And we thank you for the shed blood of Jesus in which we find forgiveness and peace. Amen. Thanks for listening. We trust today's message encouraged you as you follow Jesus. For more information about Emmanuel Church, please visit our website, glenhaven.church. Until next time, bye for now.